Hi, everybody. Uh, in this vodcast, we're going to look at the ways in which cells and get an overview of how cells actually control their genes. How do we turn genes on? How do we turn genes off? And what kind of ways does that happen? And there's we're learning so much about how genes are controlled, but these are some of sort of those ground level ways that um, some genes actually are controlled, how they're expressed, um, and what kinds of factors play into actually exposing a gene to be transcribed and then translated into a protein. So how that works and how that blends into the idea of maintaining homeostasis. So types of control mechanisms. So in this first one, we're going to get kind of an overview before we get into the specifics of how genes are actually controlled multiple levels of control because remember creating a protein has multiple steps that head into it so it depends on where are you going to control that are you going to control it at the gene level are you going to control it at the transcript level you can control it at the ribosome so tons of ways that we can look at it so we can control that gene right at the dna shut down the actual transcription shut down transcription no proteins made you could shut it down at the rna level okay so say the transcripts made but do something to prevent it from actually attaching to a ribosome and building that. Um, we could actually alter it from the polypeptide level itself. This is really amazing. Um, protein folding is a huge piece of science now in understanding how proteins actually fold. And so many ways, or so much goes into folding a protein. Um, there are other proteins um, that are known as chaperone proteins that actually aid in this. So if we were to shut down the chaperone protein that aids in the actual folding mechanism, we might not be able to um, have that product itself. And from the actual protein level itself, you could, once it's folded, there are ways that you can prevent it from actually functioning. So again, levels of control can happen at any point in the process of creating that protein or how does it work you know what causes them to happen well there are signal molecules that will initiate these processes many of these are considered hormones um, we'll look a little bit into endocrine and what hormones do and what they are by definition is anything that attaches at a receptor on the cell or even inside the cell that initiates some form of biological response which in most often is turning on a gene and those are your hormones. So we'll get a, sense, a glimpse into um, hormone properties um, a little bit down the road. How much or how little of a substance is present can affect how a gene is turned on or off. So concentrations can actually affect that. Um, we also have types of regulatory proteins that play a role, and again, we find hormones in this. There are repressor and activator proteins that you know, prevent or increase um, the use of a gene. So in some of those regulatory proteins, what we have is either negative control, so we're going to shut down gene activity, turn it off, so slow it down. Uh, we can get positive control, which is going to actually increase or speed up the activity of a gene. Positive and negative gene control. So here's just a, what I mean to give you guys kind of that overview so you can take kind of a second and peek at this. Um, on the left is the negative regulation, okay? So what we have is if we're going to, here's my gene, okay? There is a, re, you know, a repressor protein, okay, that's bound, okay? Bound repressor protein here to the gene and the gene is off, okay? So if this bound repressor protein is attached to the gene, Note the gene doesn't work, so that's a negative control. However, if I add in ligand, ligand is something that will fit into this little part on the protein, and when it does that, it alters its shape, kind of like an allosteric control mechanism, um, alters its shape, and it falls off the gene, okay, and inactivates the repressor, okay? So if that's the case and it falls off, the gene will turn on, okay? positive control, okay, regulation, the actual binding of this protein to the gene increases the activation. So we have an activator protein instead of a repressor protein. So when the activator protein is bound on, it promotes a place for RNA polymerase, which is the first enzyme to come in to attach to the promoter to turn a gene on, and voila, you get genes on, transcription, protein. Okay, 
Now, if that ligand comes in, it can attach to the activator. If the activator falls off, okay, and we don't have this, so if, so if this is removed from the process, here, RNA polymerase doesn't bind on, can't do that, gene is now. Now, there's portions of our DNA, <laughs> portions, I say, most of our DNA, uh, that is considered non-coding sequences, which means that is not, it's not a gene that specifically becomes a protein. And it's quite a bit. And much of these sequences are responsible for being, in essence, you know, they're they're the, you know, they're the entourage of a gene, I guess is the best way to put it. They are there to ensure the gene gets transcribed as it should. So we have promoter sequences. These are the start where the gene begins, if you will. Enhancer areas are where we have sites that specifically are there to bind to activator proteins. We have places where you get um, attachments of the chemical modifications that can happen to DNA. In essence, epigenetics, where we have the methylation piece and areas for methyl groups to attach that can deactivate um, a gene. Okay, so that methylation piece is there. Um, so let me go back here. Yeah, so the methyl piece is where the methyl groups actually bind to the DNA and actually prevent it from being transcribed. Okay, that's a form. The acetylation part of epigenetics is where acetyl groups will bind to the histones of the chromosome and prevent the gene from being expressed. So here's kind of a neat, um, you know, a neat study that helped look at epigenetics. We have mice. This is pretty cool. Uh, we have normal mouse, and normal mice gives birth, right, to um, her kids, okay? And some of these, so one strain of a mouse that tended to have very fat, and I'm talking fat yellow, and if you were to Google um, a goody mice, you will see these things. They are <laughs> incredible. They're big, they're fat, they're yellow. And some were normal pups, normal brown, you know, fine pups. And these agouti mice, um, the ones that had this agouti gene, actually were predisposed to things like cancer, diabetes, due to their severe obesity. And this transposon, okay, um, as they said, the remnant of a um, perhaps past virus, actually prevents, um, you know, switches on and off a gene. Now, when they took that same mouse and altered her diet, our same strain of mouse, you know, the ones that were capable of having this, altered her diet so that she had folic acid, B12, um, chlorine, you know, um, different kinds of choline, betadine, beta and these vitamins and other types of things, they were, she had way fewer pups. These things actually methylated the transposon shutting down the agouti gene. And so you can see it here, all right? So when she had this in her diet, okay, the methyl groups in things like folic acid, okay, the transposon and the gene were silenced. So that means her pups were born like normal pups, even though they might have had the gene, it was shut down. And if you shut down a gene, you don't get the trait that goes with it. So it was a really, really neat study in epigenetics. So to look at some things, here are sets of twins and the effects epigenetics has. And we watched Ghost in Your Genes, so this, um, you know, at least is familiar. Okay, so if you look over here, here is a set of chromosomes. So here's a chromosome from one child, here's the other one from its twin. So one kid, two kid, all right? And these are three-year-old twins, okay, down here. So these are three-year-olds. And if you look, very, very similar banding type patterns because they are identical. You would expect them to be identical. Their DNA is the same thing, okay? Nothing is better to do studies on the effects of genetics than using identical twins because you have ready-made clones of each other, okay? Then if we take and look at 50-year-old twins and do the same genes and the same chromosomes, notice how much variability there is in what you see in terms of banding patterns. There's a lot of differences. Now, these differences aren't caused by changes to their genes, they're caused by effects on the genes and the genes that are getting shut down and turned on due to epigenetic factors. Kind of cool. 
All right, so demethylation, if we demethylate, which is neat, okay, um, you can return the gene and turn it back on if the methyl groups get removed. All right, so I mentioned acetylation. That's just giving access um, to genes by either promoting or shutting down the behavior of a histone. Okay, so you remember the histones are what wrap around the DNA, and if I acetyl, um, acetylate a histone, it could prevent the DNA from being exposed for transcription. Okay, and so these are, so these are some of the ways that we can control and start the process of looking at how genes are affected. So there you have it. Okay, um, and we'll be moving from here into um, how some of those processes work. We'll look at prokaryotic and a little bit of eukaryotic gene control. So take it easy and have a good night.